All right, in the studio is one of our favorites from Cal State University, Channel Islands. It's the professor of environmental science, Sean Anderson. Good morning. How are you? Morning, morning. Good, doing, doing well. A little, little tired, but well. A lot going on here. Now, uh, we're coming up on the anniversary of the Thomas Fire. We are. And uh, I was out in about the evening that happened. And I remember Rich when he got the initial report, uh, the intensity and the urgency of the firefighters mm -hmm. he told everyone mm -hmm. this was going to be massive. Right. Even at that point, I don't think. I was driving in from Santa Barbara when I made the turn where you get to see that beautiful view of right. uh, the city. Right, right. Uh, it, it was all Insane. on fire. Yeah. I had never, and I've lived here since 61, uh, you know, my whole life, and I had never seen the ferocity of a fire like this. And I've seen some big ones. Yeah. Uh, so there's many reasons why this happened. So right. where would you like to start? on all of this. Should we begin with why we're having fires? Sure. Like this now? Sure. Well, so the, the first part of this is that fires are a natural part. For fires have always been part of what is uh, California, especially here in Southern California. Uh, Native Americans actively used it as a management tool. So in certain areas, they would burn to encourage a different different suite of plants, etc. So they ex instinctively knew the way that the uh, they could grow their crops and handle it best was by actually creating sure. a controlled burn. Sure, sure, because they're not they're not stupid. I mean, I mean, so the the valley floor of Yosemite looks the way that the valley floor looks to us because the Native Americans there uh, set it on fire. Otherwise, it would be trees and stuff. So in our case, one of the things a lot of the local folks did was they would um, if we had like a big oak tree. So you let let let's just be smart about it. So we could sit here and go around and collect a lot of acorns. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was a staple, a food source for them. And so they you go around and collect a little bit of acorns in this tree and then walk over there and collect. That 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 kind of sucks, right? It takes a long time. Better to have one big honking tree that you can go and spend 15 minutes collecting those acorns and be done for the day. And so to do that, one of the tools, or many tools, one of the tools they would set the meadows on fire and it would kill the little baby uh, trees. And so they have these big honking oaks that wouldn't have any competitors for water and they get really big. And it goes on and on. So fire is a natural part of our ecosystem. A lot of our plants need fire to, to regenerate and complete its complete its um, um, uh, the, their life cycles. So that, that, that's what's, when it went on forever. Then er, in the early 1900s, we found Gifford Pinchot, we found the National Forest uh, Service. So the Forest Service was about saving stuff. So saving stuff not for the critters or not for whatever. It was, the notion was a utilitarian approach. Hey, these trees, if they burn, we can't turn them into houses. We can't turn them into chairs. So they started our modern, they started the, the big modern problem, which was suppress fires, Smokey the Bear, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, okay, anytime there's a fire, put it out, put it out, put it out. And what that has done is that's led to these huge fuel buildups across, especially the western U.S. And so when we used to have a little fire, lightning strike or something, it would smolder and it would catch a little area on fire and a relatively small area would burn and take up the fuel. The big trees would survive. They'd have a little blackening on their trunks, but they would more or less survive. But what's happened in, in the, the 7,500 years since that, um, we've had this huge fuel buildup. So now instead of um, you know, a little bit of fire, it's a massive conflagration. Um, and so, so we have to deal with that. And we are, we are taking steps to deal with that. We have a lot of fuels. Then the other part of this is a climate change. And Well, actually, sorry, before we get to that, is our policies of how we allow development in and around natural landscapes. So we've allowed more and more people to build into these areas. People used to mostly live in concentrations in cities, and so that was, those were easy to defend. Now as we have these exurban, these suburban things that are more and more, you know, Ojai, Thousand Oaks, uh, Montecito, all these areas that we move into these burnable landscapes, um, uh, now there's a gazillion more places that could burn. People are closer to the fires, so that so that, that development policy. Now we saw that in the campfire, for example, the, the policies that allowed more housing to go into areas that were more dangerous, etc. And then the third part of it is climate change. So climate change, um, much drier, uh, uh, the, the less water in general. To the temperatures, for example, um, we were just talking over the break. Uh, the uh, during the Woolsey fire, the start of the Woolsey fire, we had like three and four percent relative humidity. That's insane for Thanksgiving time to have. I mean, that that's crazy dry and dry for days on end. And so then when we get our Santa Anas, which we used to have Santa Anas, which are again are a natural thing, we used to get Santa Anas for a day or two or three or so, and it would be you know strong winds. But now we're having these winds for, as with the Thomas fire, for weeks on end, and that's just fueling these fires. And so um, we're actually starting to see, which is becoming a bit more common now, is um, 
in places like Malibu after the Woolsey fire, in places like Paradise after the campfire, we're seeing these big trees again persisting. So they're not dying. The, the flames are going virtually horizontal across the hillside with this fire weather. And so, so the, these, the, with, it, with all these fires, Thomas, etc., the huge run is the first night, the first night or two nights, right? That's the huge area, boom. And then the rest of the many weeks of the fire is burning, it's still growing, but it's, it's relatively <laughs> um, minor compared to that first big run. Is there again now you talked about the goodness of fire yeah. you know from from nature's yeah. standpoint is there anything that we can draw that's good from the fire Oh absolutely now? so okay so so for first and foremost fire is a rejuvenating force so fire is what allows the divert so if we have a, cl- a purely say monoculture of coastal sage scrub or whatever the the community we're talking about is that's not good Right, um, or that's not that's not the maximum diversity of birds, of critters, of water holding capacity of the soil to to keep floods from happening. What we like is we have like these patchy areas, these so-called heterogeneous areas, and so those areas are promoted by fire. We do have in studio from Cal State University, Channel Islands professor of environmental science, Sean Anderson. I need you to stay a little bit here, and yeah, yeah. I'd love to check with you, and we're going to have Kim on also talking about happenings. At the campus, 752 here at News Talk 1590 KVTA. Okay, finding the conversation endlessly interesting with uh, <laughs> Professor Sean Anderson, environmental science. I hear this is stuff that we can apply to everything. That's it's true. It's not only science, it's economy. That's true. It's uh, safety. Yep. Uh, this covers um, how we spend our tax money. Absolutely. Suppression. So this is a huge topic for everybody. Uh, to really understand what we might have to do in the future for firefighting. Absolutely. And all of that. So uh, this is important for our community. So so uh, just f- so we do this public opinion polling every fall. So we survey somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 people, Southern Santa Barbara, Ventura, Northern Los Angeles counties. And what our most recent data, I just ha- pulled up our most recent data from a couple months, from about a month and a half ago, um, 86% of our folks think that uh, climate change is a serious challenge we should be dealing with. Three quarters think that it played at least some role in the Thomas fire, which it did. And then we talk about, what you were mentioning, what were the impacts? Um, a third of folks we talked to were not impacted by the Thomas fire uh, and the associated fires at the same time. 45% had a significant initial impact. Either their business was had to be shuttered or they were evacuated or they, part of their house was burned or whatever. 15% are still having an impact. And this is being magnified. And this was just the Thomas fire, right? Thomas fire was, got all the attention. Oh my God, it's the biggest fire in state history. Not anymore. Now it's the second biggest fire. Mm-hmm. And, as we, and so, so this stuff is, being pl- is playing out in, in, in inland areas and in rural areas and in, in, in Tawny Malibu, um, all these things. And, and what, we're, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to make people scared. We're not trying to make people afraid or whatever. We think, I think we can solve these problems, but we have to be honest about it. I was just at a conference when the, when the, when the uh, Woolsey fire broke out. So this killer conference in San Diego, awesome conference, mostly business folks, business, government, military, uh, and academics um, called, called Blue Tech about how we manage the coast. And there was no debating about climate change. There's no debating about this or that. It's like, hey, here's a problem. Let's solve it. Let's use the entrepreneurial spirit of America and let's throw some stuff and let's solve this problem. Let's stop being this silly fighting one another and go forward. So if we don't deal with these problems, we're saying we, we love having a year, we love having no more fire season. We love having fires burn all the time. We love paying gazillion billion dollars to firemen to work overtime. We love having to hire search dogs to go find kids and, in, in, you know, burn bodies and things like that. That's not what we want. There, there are ways to deal with this, but we need to deal with it in an adult manner and go forward and, and solve these things. And they are solvable? They all are, sov- are, are solvable. Now, because we've, we've sort of dillied for so long. Dillied? Is that the word? Dallied? Who, yes. who the heck? Dilly, dilly or something? So because we've, we've waited so long to deal with this, um, it, it's getting harder and more expensive. But the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to be, the sure. more dislocating. So, so, yeah, so, I mean, the other thing people should be very proud of is Ventura County is incredibly forward-thinking. So the policies that we've started to uh, years ago to, for example, brush clearances around houses and stuff, um, the policies of Ventura and San Diego counties are now the policies of the state. 
when the Woolsey fire was happening, I'm watching the news coverage, a map of the fires, okay, there's the fires, and then of the evacuation. What do we, how do we get people out of here safely? What you would see on KTLA or whatever the, the LA you know, news stations, there would be the fire map, and then there'd be the evacuation map, but it would only show people evacuating in Ventura County. There was no, there was no evacuation zone polygon and things for, in LA. The reason being that Ventura is so much more advanced in terms of getting this information out, making it, put it in a, a form that's easy for you to consume, other reporters to consume, the public to consume. That's awesome. You go to the LA website and it says, uh, you know, of course they had the information there, but it's between road blah 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 and road blah 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 and north of blah 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 and blah 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 blah. And when you're when you're freaking out trying to figure out if you're leaving your house, that doesn't help. That doesn't help. And so, yeah. so, so there are things we can do, um, and we are beginning to do them. Well, I have more coming up here with Cal State University Channel Islands. It is Professor Environmental Science Sean Anderson. We'll talk about the programs the kids can get involved with yep. when you get an education there. And yep. We'll also talk about events coming up at the campus at 759 at KVTA. It is 804 We Are News Talk 1590 KVTA. Cal State University Channel Islands. Great conversation. We're going to continue that into uh, the hour and uh, talk a little bit more about what's going on in the community. Uh, what are some of the methods we can do uh, to uh, protect and save people and our resources? Plus, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the areas that didn't burn and the dangers that might be in store for them. Plus, right after traffic, Kim is going to tell us about stuff happening on campus. It's 8.04 here at KVTA. But I tell you, in the it's beautiful, and yeah, with the trailers, people can make fun. If you've ever seen a double wide that's done up, it's as good as any like small house you've ever seen. But it was taught with this oak tree. What are you guys? If it starts, you will not get out of here. Or collapses. You will, that's oh, what oaks do. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, it gets wet. And that's true with all of the uh, dryness because of... And one second thing, isn't this beautiful? The next second, you're in hell. Yeah. Yep. And how are you going to get out of there? It's still amazing when I look at how quickly they evacuated like the Hawaiian Garden apartment. I thought for sure when I saw it go up, how many dead. That there would be the the person. So Kim, we'll go to you first, and we'll do news, and we'll wrap up with the fires. What's happening on campus? Okay, we've got uh, an art exhibit that's uh, unique. It's called the Oxnard Plane, and it's in the Johns Boardroom Library Gallery. That's on the second floor. The Oxnard Plane is actually a cooperative of local Oxnard artists who support one another and they mentor one another and they provide a space for the artists to work in the Carnegie Art Museum in Oxnard. Um, our exhibit at John's Broom Library is open now and on Thursdays from 11 to 2, this is what's really cool, there will be a workshop uh, with mentors there in which anybody can go in and create art hmm. on an on-site computer and it will be part of the show. They'll put it up on the wall. Um, so certainly drop by. It's open now. Just be really quiet when you walk in because there are students. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there certainly are. Okay. Yeah, I want to mention too that Dr. Anderson got an award for his um, the way he educates as an educator at the Blue Tech Conference because he gets his students in there in the mud, in the water, in the with field. drones. Yeah, exactly. So congratulations. And Thank can you. you stay with us for just a few yeah, yeah. minutes? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. 807. Go to News Now with Rich Galano. And we are here at News Talk 1590 KVT, going to wrap it up with Professor of Environmental Science, Sean Anderson, in studio with us. Uh, quick uh, note on something that we talked about off air. The amount of pollution and particles that were put into uh, in to the air. Yep. Another thing, and I don't know if it's the wimpification. Ooh, the wimpies. The wimpification. I like that. The weakness, America. the growing weakness. When I was a kid, there was a lot of fires around us. Yeah. I never saw anybody wear any kind of mask whatsoever for inhaling of. Oh yeah, smoke. sure. Okay, so, so now we see a lot of this. Some people aren't even wearing a mask that's appropriate, and I know some people do have respiratory mm -hmm. illnesses. How much of a health hazard is this? Uh, it's it's gotten much worse. So 
a lot of times, well, there's a couple, there's several different ways we could talk about that. One, back in when you were young, most of the stuff that was burning was grass and, mm -hmm. and, and vegetation. Yeah, right, sure. So that's, that's problematic, but that's one level problematic. When we have things like the campfire, the Woolsey fire, all stuff that are burning in urban areas, now you have your paints in the garage and you have your tires and all, there's a whole bunch, a mix of other stuff, potentially high toxicity stuff. So that's one. Two, um, we do have a lot more respiratory um, uh, 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 problems these days. And so a lot of more, many more people, proportionally speaking, are, are compromised in terms of they have COPD or something going on. Third thing is we just didn't understand how bad that stuff was back in the day. And so, so the, the standards for what's acceptable have, have gotten much, much higher. And so what used to be back in the day, oh, go through and just put your, you know, your, your elbow over your mouth, that's White fine. Rag and now it's, it's much, and, if, and if, so now what most people recommend in these situations are uh, N95 particle masks, which you can get at Home Depot, but most people don't wear them properly. They take these regular, uh, like sort of uh, uh, dust masks, and they put them over their face. They have to have a perfect seal around your nose, around your cheeks, around your chin, or that that gunk just gets in from the side. So most people are using those, not necessarily working so well. So this was the basis for um, in Sacramento and Chico in those areas a couple weeks ago. They said, don't use. They stopped giving out N95 particle masks, and they just said, here the deal is, don't go outside, because so many unless you have it properly fit it's not going to give you the benefit. And so you have people walking around doing stuff, thinking they have protection. I mean, the classic one, I, I use a picture in my lectures about the Thomas Fire, of these guys surfing. They're walking down to go surf, and they have, they have masks on to go surf. And it just, you know, sort of orange, otherworldly sky. It just sort of seemed to encapsulate the craziness of the Thomas Fire. But, um, but it, it, yeah, so, yeah, I, we're, we're, we're kind of a little more wimpy, but we're also more understanding the true risks of this stuff and the intensity and the danger of that, that those particulates and those smokes have gotten uh, more problematic. And there's nothing worse than doing something thinking it's for the good and it's absolutely no good for you. Yeah, right, you know, right, you, right. You're getting out Wasting the, the energy, placebo, with, yeah. The placebo yeah. effect, maybe, yeah. uh, but probably not. When it comes down to it, what, what can we really do? Um, do we turn off our air conditioning? Do we drive less? Do we? So, you know, if the global yeah. warming thing is yeah. happening. And well, it, it is, is happening, but yes, but yeah, yes. But, and yes. caused by whom or right. by what? Right, So Us, what, do we, what right. do we do? So, uh, so what we do is we, we so um, I just had uh, our, our, friends from the Western States Petroleum Association into my class on Friday. We're talking about uh, ener coastal energy policy, all this stuff. So the reality is the first thing is we have to have a conversation with everybody, not like the one, people look like this, the people look like that, the people look like everything that come from all sectors. So um, uh, th th this, this whole climate change thing is completely, completely crazy and completely un-American as far as I can tell. When we've historically had problems, Russians, Sputnik, Nazis, well, it, the answer is, oh my God, there's this challenge. Let's mobilize and solve this. We've been mired in this, is it happening, is it not happening? And that's forestalled a lot of the true innovation and stuff that we can have going on. So, so the, I'd say the first thing is to, to, to stay engaged with the process, what's going on. It's not too complex for folks to understand. Our, our, our own government just released, every, every four years we release an assessment. Our, uh, the Trump administration just released the Friday after Thanksgiving um, our current uh, national assessment. What is climate change doing now to crops, to all this and that? In there, there in addition to just saying what's going on, there's also uh, ways we can respond. So this includes things like changing our fuel system, you know, getting the ele electric cars and all that kind of stuff. But that's the that's the sort of sexy, uh, you know, kind of expensive end of things. And and again, because we've waited so long, the costs to deal with this are going up higher and higher and higher. But there's also a bunch of things that don't necessarily take a, a million a million, a million dollars or don't necessarily take um, an act of Congress to deal with. And so those include things like um, uh, a drinking water out of a, out of a glass. Right, as opposed to a plastic water bottle that, that, that was all this embodied energy that had to move Awkward. from all over the place. No, 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 no I'm serious. No, so, 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 those those types of things are. It's a mix, and the reality is, just like with energy policy, this has to be everything on board. It has to be the big high policy, the state level policies. It has to be people choosing things, and first and foremost, it has to be the folks that believe in that, that no climate change is going on have to be willing to talk to people that say it's not. The people that say it's not have 
have to be willing to talk to people. We have to be able to have a conversation again and not think that we're all evil and we're all out to destroy the planet or destroy business or destroy the world or whatever. And and it's been very hard in the last um, last few years here. It's like everything seems to be a zero sum game. There you go. Metal there you go. Metal straw, my brother. That's it. There you go. See. Saving the planet. See, I like it. But and we got to wrap it up now. But a great eight with at the house. And all those things. The disposable is, culture. Yeah, everything yep. is disposable. I remember as a kid when they said there would be a disposable camera. We couldn't stop laughing. What are you, mad? They can't make that dis disposable cameras. We have such yep. a throwaway. Yep. When your TV set broke in the old days, you pulled the TV you fixed out, it. you went to save right. on, you got it, you got the guy in there. Now we just get a new one. We just right. get a new one. And we have, Alvin Toffler nailed this so many years ago. And, uh, you know, talking about the disposable throwaway society. Yeah. What was the book called again? Uh, oh, come on. Uh, oh, one minute to think. If people want to go over to the college, find out more yeah. about your programs, yeah. and, and get educated in this field, what do they do? So that they can check out our, our website, ES Thomas Fire, how people are currently being impacted by the Woolsey Fire. And so uh, all that stuff will be up on those, on those websites. Very important conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sean Anderson, Environmental Science. It is... Uh, a, a classroom experience that is very much outside too. Hands Good on, work. hands Good on. Work that you're doing, and uh, thank you so much for coming in as always here at News Talk 1590 KBK. Al, we'll get to you in just a moment.